Well, the final panel of the day is going to be addressing Turkey's foreign policy and foreign policy making. Let me introduce um, Alper Joshkun, who will be moderating the discussion. Well, thank you, Alper. It's, um, it's really great. Uh, uh, great to see you here, host you here. Alper is a senior fellow uh, at the Carnegie Endowment's Europe program, and he uh, served, which year, when did you leave uh, Turkish MFA? In 2021, I retired. So yeah, until 2021, he was in, uh, in Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now he's with us, and he will be uh, moderating this discussion. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you, welcome um, everyone. It's very, very nice to be with all of you. We, um, we have a tough act to follow on from, from this morning and uh, this afternoon. We had two wonderful sessions, but I think uh, we're also up to the task of making sure that everyone keeps engaged in the, in the afternoon. But we're lucky because we have an, an all-star cast. Um, you all have their CVs, so with their indulgence, with your indulgence, I will not go into the details of all of their accomplishments, which are many. Uh, but I will uh, just briefly introduce them to you. Um, to my left is uh, Shafak Göktürk, uh, who is a, a retired ambassador. He had three um, chief of mission uh, postings in uh, Egypt, in Norway, and in Singapore. Uh, he was my boss on various occasions, so I tread very lightly, as you can imagine, uh, and I learned a lot from him. He was one of the true points of references for uh, younger generation diplomats as we were reading his dispatches, particularly from Cairo in the very turbulent times. We have Evran Balta uh, Hoca, uh, who is from Özgen University. Uh, she has uh, accomplished herself as a point of reference in terms of Turkish foreign policy, security policy, domestic uh, issues, uh, and uh, has written extensively on these uh, items, uh, and I'm very happy that she's joined us today. Alan Makowski is uh, no stranger to anyone, I believe, in this room. He is one of the most um, um, informed analysts on Turkey in many different respects. Uh, he has an academic background, but also a practitioner's background. Uh, and he has served in, in different uh, postings, both on the Hill, but also abroad. And it's very nice to have him with us. And last but not least, Soli Özel, who is, uh, you know, in my view, one of the, the deans of, of uh, trying to understand Turkey. He's the point of reference, uh, someone who I closely follow, both in terms of Turkish foreign policy, but uh, as well uh, in terms of domestic developments. He's a, a lecturer, a senior lecturer at the Kadir Has, Kadir Has University in Istanbul. Um, and um, I hope that we'll have a lively discussion. My intention is to pose our panelists a couple of questions, uh, give them each five to seven minutes, uh, and then uh, maybe one more question after that, and then turn to you um, to hopefully have a lively discussion on Turkish foreign policy. Now, the, the discussions that we had in the morning set the stage very well. Um, Gönül mentioned, I wasn't going to make this point, but I might as well. I wasn't going to mention the fact that I, I'm a retired diplomat, but you know, listening to the conversations, I was sort of happy that I'm retired and I don't have to raise my <laughs> hand and stick up for Turkey in all those different areas, because it is, it is fraught, as we saw, both in terms of the, uh, the first panel that we listened to that focused on the identity of, of Turkey and the different uh, fault lines and the challenges. And then we looked at uh, other developments, domestic developments, the role of Islam in Turkey. Uh, and to me, if I distill all of that conversation in addition to the obvious challenges and difficulties, um, complexity is what comes to my mind. Uh, and I think we see that element in foreign policy, which we're going to debate now at the centennial of uh, the founding of the Turkish Republic. Where is Turkish foreign policy? And uh, the, the title that was chosen for this event uh, is perfect because it, says about, it talks about Turkey being between the East and the West the perennial dichotomy in every aspect of Turkey, I think, but also in terms of its foreign policy. Uh, yet this is a dichotomy that until recently, I think Turkey was able to manage relatively well. Uh, this is an element that al always existed, I would argue, even during the Ottoman era, where you had uh, elements of the East and the West, obviously. But in terms of foreign policy, until recently, there was no significant debate as to Turkey's orientation, if you will. And then we started hearing these debates as to whether Turkey was changing axes, whether it was moving in another direction. Today, we talk about Turkey as to whether it is more a part of the global south or not. Uh, and it's interesting to try and understand why it has uh, come here, because when you look at the initial 10 years of the Erdogan era, uh, 
actually the alignment in terms of foreign policy orientation had not yet been shaken to this extent. You know, Turkey is a founding main member of the Council of Europe, and it was during the Erdogan era that the individual right to petition to the European Court of Human Rights was uh, embedded in the Turkish Constitution, something that is now being debated. Turkey is a member, long-standing member of NATO, never put into doubt. And it was in the Erdogan era that Turkey managed to meet the Copenhagen criteria, and there were big celebrations in Ankara with Erdogan at the forefront uh, because Turkey had become a candidate for full membership in the European Union. And look where we are today. So what is it that happened in the manner that it happened, uh, that it's come to this point, is something that we will debate in probably the second uh, part of our questions. But I want to start off, Evrenojum, if you don't mind, with you, um, to uh, have you walk us through a little bit of a comparative analysis of Turkish foreign policy pre Erdogan and where we see it okay. nowadays, if you don't sure. mind. Thank you. Um, let me start from very left. Um, I do teach Turkish foreign policy for um, a decade or so. And the book that I started to teach Turkish foreign policy was Baskin Oran's uh, Turkish foreign policy book, which was published in 2001. Uh, it became the major classic in the field, and it has, I guess, like 25 reprints uh, up until now um, in the last 20 years or so. Uh, why I am mentioning this book? Uh, because the book's analytical contribution was basically situating Turkey or debating Turkey uh, and debating Turkish foreign policy uh, as Turkey being a middle power. And the book opens up the debate around Turkey being a middle power uh, by uh, discussing or analytically defining what a middle power is. And it says that uh, major powers provide order, the international order, either regionally or globally, and middle powers ability or strength basically come from adopting or aligning to the system or to the order that, are, that is provided by the major powers. Um, and Bask Noran continues by arguing that uh, middle powers have a bargaining power, but that bargaining power is only a limited power. And uh, then this, you have this huge volume uh, where um, uh, the ability of Turkey or the capacity of Turkey uh, to have, in order, I mean, to, 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 to come up with an autonomous foreign policy, autonomous from the international order that's provided by the major powers is possible or not. Um, in the early day, if, if I work through, if I go through, or if I use this concept of middle power, in the early days of the Republic, uh, Turkey really, or in the early days of the Cold War, in fact, Turkey really didn't have the material capacity to become a middle, or to be considered as a middle power, neither the uh, economic power nor the military power. Yet, the strength of Turkey or the capacity of Turkey was its alignment or adaptation capacity to the international order, either through its strategic position or uh, being the buffer state between the Soviet Union and, and, and Europe. Uh, as a result of this strategic position of Turkey, it became a NATO member, as you mentioned, in 1952, uh, and thus became a member of the security architecture of the uh, transatlantic alliance. Uh, it was not just, Turkey was not just a member of the um, security architecture of the Transatlantic Alliance, uh, but it also has the aspiration of uh, becoming a democratic country or a member of the democratic uh, club. Multi-party elections uh, were, were held uh, in 1946 for the first time. Uh, and, and again, as you said, uh, Turkey was the founding member of Council of Europe in 1949, uh, ratified the ECHR in 1954, uh, and the idea of catching up with the West, uh, both economically and normatively and institutionally, was pretty much ingrained into the um, ideas of the political elites of the Turkish Republic in the, throughout the 20th century. That didn't all mean that, I mean, um, throughout the 20th century again, that the geostrategic interests of Turkey and the transatlantic alliance were always aligned. Consider the Cyprus issue, for example. Um, the legacy of the Cyprus issue is uh, still with us. It still is a problem between Turkey and the EU. Even the recent Borel report starts with the Cyprus issue as an impediment against the Turkish EU membership, as a, as a, as a condition 
even for the customs union. So it's still there. But this is, this is a long history, but let me stop. Um, um, in the, I mean, let, let me finish the first part and, and um, compare it with the second peri period or what happened In three minutes, afterwards. Please. What is it? In three minutes. In three minutes, of course, okay. So the Cold War ended in 1999, and uh, we discussed this in the morning. Uh, then Turkey became this uh, model country um, uh, for the post-Soviet political space from Adriatic to China Bowl. This was something mentioned in the morning as well, uh, has become this, uh, this motto of the Turkey's assertive foreign policy. And the assertive foreign policy, what I'm trying to say that assertive foreign policy was already there in the 1990s, but it became sort of very different in the 2000s and specifically after 2010. Um, the, 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 I mean, the causes of this change uh, is both external and domestic. It goes back to 2008 financial crisis, the role of the West in the international system, 2011 Arab uprisings, Kurdish question, coup d'etat, um, and so on and so forth. Many things happened in between. Um, and what we see in the last decade is that there is this emphasis, and that's a debatable concept and, and a problematic concept, but the Turkish governing elites began to emphasize, uh, it put emphasis on Turkey's strategic autonomy, um, and uh, the rationale behind the strategic autonomy uh, that is widely used by the Turkish political elites is that uh, Western alliance or the transatlantic alliance doesn't really provide our needs. Uh, it doesn't correspond to our needs as such. Uh, and this idea that Turkey being a middle power is no longer um, basically enjoyed by the political elites as well. Uh, the, they be, began to refer to Turkey as not a middle power, but a regional power with hegemonic aspirations. Uh, and now Turkey has this military power and economic power as well, specifically in the beginning of 2010s, to, um, I mean, beginning of 2010, and began to use military power outside of its borders in Syria, Libya, created transnational linkages, uh, widely used the soft power in many regions and areas, uh, created state-like structures um, in Syria as well, um, and, and, and has become this regional hegemonic or a po regional power with hegemonic aspirations, far exceeding uh, what we expect from basically middle powers. I'll stop with three points here. I don't have much time. Um, this assertive foreign policy, I think, has three major problems, maybe more, but I'll just mention three. Uh, first, contrary to other powers, other middle powers who are enjoying in this period, in the exact, exact, exact same period, um, sort of as autonomy, Turkey has, was, oh, still is a member of NATO and transatlantic alliance and transatlantic institutions. And that created, I mean, Turkey's quest for autonomy created fractures, problems within the transatlantic alliance and also for Turkey's foreign policy, precisely for this reason, because you are still a member of NATO. And Turkey had these problems of, you know, like uh, sometimes felt it as a cage um, that really limits its autonomy and sometimes used it in, in, in favor of its national interest. The second problem that Turkey's assertive foreign policy is really about this uh, change in the Turkey's identity. I mean, it really aligned with Turkey's changing national identity as well. Uh, so the Turkish political elites, governing elites, AKP, President Erdogan, began to reimagine uh, the borders of Turkey through Muslim nationalist identity, something we discussed in the morning. And that coupled with the uh, domestic polariz polarizing dynamics of Turkey and foreign policy became the battleground for, for, uh, for Turkey as well. So there were domestic challenges for foreign policy uh, orientation of Turkey um, and the, whether Turkey should be Western, keep its Western orientation or not has become really a battleground, a domestic battleground for Turkey. And finally, um, the, the final problem that Turkey had is the capacity problem. Uh, so Turkey's ambition to become a hegemonic power, uh, which was undertaken without a proper assessment of its capabilities, 
uh, has really backfired and Turkey finds itself in complete isolation both regionally and globally. And what has been going on in the last three years, Turkish uh, political elites again, or um, diplomatic elites as well, trying to change this course of uh, becoming completely isolated, but we can discuss this um, maybe later on or in the q and So. Erojan, thank you very much. You, you describe Turkey increasingly displaying elements of being a, a middle power, uh, and I think the most salient feature that you referred to was the assertiveness in its foreign policy, emboldenment uh, in some ways, and you identified some of the challenges, and one of those that you mentioned was about the fact that Turkey is a member of the Western security architecture, and that indeed is a tension that we often see because despite uh, increasing um, affinity um, uh, with, with Russia, for example, or even references to maybe joining the Shanghai, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Within a matter of days or weeks, you see references to the fact that Turkey has been a member of the NATO alliance. Quite a confusing uh, picture. So, yeah, I'd like to move over to you, uh, if you don't mind, and, and ask you to pick up from, from where Evran uh, left off, but to also talk a little bit about the different sort of elements that have crept into the thinking and the, the, the application of Turkish foreign policy. Evran did mention uh, projection of power, uh, and she referenced the fact as a second problem that domestic dynamics were also um, increasingly relevant in terms of foreign policy making. And I think some of the uh, policies that we've seen have also had an ideological uh, element to them, as we've seen in, in, in deployment, and the support that the AKP government has given to uh, to various governments, particularly in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. So if you could kindly um, share your views on that, I'd be, I'd be appreciated. I'll Thank give you. it a try. <clears throat> now, I'll start where Evren started, that is the book that we all used, Baskin Oran and Companies, a Turkish Foreign Policy. Their premise was that there were three constants about the conduct of Turkish foreign policy. And one was Western orientation. The thing is, when the book was written and when the Turkish Republic was founded, there was no other orientation to speak of. And by the time the uh, AKP governments reached their second decade, the West was not the West that it was 90 years earlier. So I think we have to take this into consideration when we evaluate the orientation or the temptations, maybe more rightly, of Turkish foreign policy. Secondly, that's a great book which is actually useless as a textbook because it's too big, too detailed. You cannot get your students to actually follow all <laughs> the details. For me, a much more pertinent book a book that over which you could actually debate Turkish foreign policy on a grander scale, theoretically, was uh, a friend and colleague, Malik Mufti of Tufts University's uh, Daring and Caution in Turkish Security Culture. And there, Mufti suggests that there were two traditions in the conduct of Turkish foreign policy since the beginning of the Republic, based on, of course, the legacy of the empire and the dissolution of empire. One was the traditional conservative Republican tendency, and the other one, the imperial urge. What I, in a more, uh, what shall I say, a banal fashion, describe as Enverism versus Ataturkism. Enverism is ambitious and imperious, and never really thinks about capacity whereas Ataturkism is basically much more realistic, knows exactly where, what the capacity actually allows you to do, and therefore, rather than seeking adventures, prefers to be cautious in the pursuit of foreign policy goals. And his argument also is that even at the time when in the 1950s we all learned that Turkish foreign policy was nothing but a derivative of American foreign policy because of the Cold War. His argument is the imperial temptation was there and the cases in point were Turkish, first of all, Turkey's insistence on the Baghdad Pact, uh, second, and therefore 
it was not oblivious to the Middle East at all, whether you liked the way it was engaged with the Middle East is a different matter. It was not oblivious to it. It never was, by the way. And second, that it wanted to intervene in Syria and it wanted to intervene in Iraq, and in twice the Americans actually stopped them. So when we come to 1991, those constraints are gone. And by the way, in between, you know, one, one of the refrains of AKP was, oh, they had a pacifist uh, foreign policy, they have not really protected the true in national interests of the country and stuff. Of course, that means you, they did not have any autonomy, but they were just lackeys of the US. Well, Turkey intervened in Cyprus. When that was a major national interest matter, Turkey intervened in Cyprus without uh, taking into consideration whatever objections might come from its ally, the United States, or actually, in spite of the refusal of Britain to actually join it, since there had been a coup in, uh, in, in Cyprus, which could have turned very bloody against the Turkish Cypriots. Therefore, even at the height of the Cold War or during the Cold War, Turkish foreign policy was capable of either attempting or actually implementing autonomous foreign policy. Then comes 1991. Uh, or 1989, the Cold War is over. And wh what is really interesting is uh, the, the Western partners therefore take Turkey as dead. You know, like, I remember, and I have to, allow me, I have to relate this. I'm sitting at home, April 1990, and the late journalist Mehmed Ali Biran, may he rest in peace, had this program called the 32nd Day. It was a monthly program something we were not accustomed to. He could speak to world leaders. And he was interviewing Larry Eagleburger, who at the time was the Under Secretary of State. And Eagleburger says to uh, Birant, says, you know, you know, the Cold War is over. You really are not a European country. Maybe you should preoccupy yourself with the Middle East. I literally dropped from the seat I was sitting on. Years later, before he died, I asked Birant if I remembered it correctly. He said, yes, you remember it correctly. Now, for me, the best neighbor Turkey has ever had is Saddam Hussein. Because every time Turkey found itself in trouble, he did something stupid and elevated Turkey. <laughs> and then he invaded Kuwait, and everybody rediscovered Turkey. And then the, the Soviet Union disappeared. And then you had this vast space of what we now call the ex-Soviet space that opened up with energy and Turkey, some cultural or historical relations to it. And that's when what Evren said at the beginning, uh, new ambitions, the, uh, the, the Turkic world from the Adriatic Sea to the Great Wall of China, that idea, which resonated, of course, with the imperial tradition in the country, really began to take root in a country that believed after having lost an empire, that it was not being given the chance to actually live up to its own historical mission. And as, um, when, when the AKP came to power, the West was still on a high, you know, the history has ended, the European Union actually created the uh, rule of 21st century, the United States was unprecedentedly uh, powerful and unipolar world and whatever, and then a number of mistakes on the part of the United States have uh, followed one another. You allow China to join the World uh, Trade Organization and uh, within eight years, China goes from being 3.5% of the world economy to about 13% uh, of the world economy. Please don't be offended if you are a supporter of the Iraq war. As, as, uh, Talleyrand said it was worse than a crime, it was a mistake, it was an awful blunder, and part of the reason why you don't get heard or you don't get believed in the world today has to do with the way you conducted, or the US conducted, or the Bush administration conducted the Iraq war. And then the icing on the cake came when, um, we, in 2008, it was the United States that actually triggered the world economic crisis. And so when uh, the, uh, AKP reached its second decade and the uh, Arab revolts took place, the West wasn't the West that it was. Uh, and new opportunities have opened up. And the idea was, okay, we are a regional power. 
with global ambitions. And this is truly, this is truly our moment. And until then, I think a fair argument can be and should be made that AKP's foreign policy prioritized economic interests. Turkey's investments and openings in Africa began in, in mid-2000s. Um, but with the uh, Arab revolt, suddenly two dream, one dream of Islamists everywhere flared up. If Sykes-Picot designed order in the Middle East a hundred years earlier, the Arab revolt gave the peoples of the region, Muslims, the opportunity to reverse this. And who better than Turkey to lead this uh, re um, revision of, 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 of the geopolitical reality in, in the region? That's when the, the, uh, the uh, foreign policy, in my judgment, turned very ideological, blinding them. And it lasted until 2021 because the deal was as I see it, and I'll stop here, that with the Arab revolts, as a combination of many other things, there were three, and of course the Iraq war, the kind of extremely violent sectarianization that it triggered and all that, three axes have formed, after, especially after the Syrian war was not going well, that sought hegemonic, if not controls, hegemonic presence in the region. One was the Iranian one, Iran, which was, thanks to the United States, not given Iraq, which was its only balancer, which had Syria and non-state organizations such as Hezbollah and then the Houthis. That was the Shia axis. The second one that Turkey tried was uh, itself, Qatar and Muslim Brotherhood. And the third one was on the defensive at the beginning, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Jordan. In 2021, basically Turkey threw in the towel. It had to accept that it was really not a contender in this. And so it left the two axes, the Saudi-led one and the Iran-led one. But it still wishes to have, it still wishes to have a role. And I think we may be in the transitional phase of moving away from an ideological foreign policy, although it's very difficult to shed all its uh, influences, and to move towards a much more realistic, uh, perhaps, positioning. It's not that apparent, but for those of you who follow Turkey and who may have looked at your phones this morning, I mean, I was truly, I was, I, I was, um, how shall I say, I, I just admired it. The president said that his friend, Michu, Prime Minister Mitsotakis, and he had a wonderful discussion. This is the same Mitsotakis that last year was dismissed as a non-existent person. And that, of course, it was not a threat towards Greece, but a threat towards the terrorists when he said something. And that since we are neighbors, we are destined to have friendly and good relations. And this is in the middle of uh, what to many of us, rightly or wrongly, appears to be an extraordinarily or an, an exaggeratedly uh, exaggerated language that he chooses to use on the Gaza conflict, which for all intents and purposes may very well keep Turkey out of a lot of positive things that it can do when this damn thing is finally over. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. I was you, you helped me a lot because uh, as a former diplomat, one of the things I've been struggling with is the fact that 30 plus years of uh, on the job training and the reflexes that I've gained from that no longer work nowadays. And I was trying to understand why and I think that was a perfect, uh, very structured uh, explanation as to why things have changed. And some of the undercurrents that you spoke about, which are longer than the AKP, the imperial ambition component that you spoke about, I think it was dormant, but it was always there. It's an interesting one. But I think the more recent one, of course, is this belief in the demise of the West that uh, really trickled into the mindset of the leadership. And I think it, it culminated in, in policy uh, actions uh, as well. And I'm curious, Alan, I want to come to you now, if you don't mind, because I'd be interested in, in hearing from you how that 
is, is perceived, that evolution, if you will, is perceived on the part of the United States at the end of the day in all of the uh, State Department statements. Uh, all we hear about Turkey, initially it was a so-called ally, but then the importance of Turkey was remembered after the disastrous withdrawal, again with all due respect, from Afghanistan. Uh, and then with Ukraine, I think Turkey was, was remembered again. It could have been remembered again, it should have been remembered again, at least initially, I think, in the context of Gaza, but we forfeited that opportunity because of uh, some of the statements from President Erdogan. But my question to you is, how is this evolution viewed uh, in Washington? And this, this tension between rhetoric, ambition, emboldenment, and capacity, how is that evaluated uh, when talked about uh, among Americans here? Yeah, well, it hasn't gone down well in general. Um, uh, I think um, when you say emboldenment and capacity, um, I think there is a general feeling in Washington that Turkey talks far more boldly than its capacity uh, warrants. Um, and um, as you alluded to regarding the possibility of Turkish involvement in the Middle East problem. You notice when Blinken made his first trip to the Middle East, uh, he didn't stop in Turkey. Um, what did Erdogan say on October 7th? He said, you know, we can meet again. Um, that was not taken. Uh, <laughs> It was not taken very seriously. At least I think we have to judge that was the case based on the Blinken itinerary. On his next trip, um, uh, it was a very strange circumstance. Um, Blinken uh, and the State Department did not really announce a Turkish stop. Uh, Blinken was already, Turkey had said Blinken was coming, but the US did not present it as part of his itinerary until he was already, I believe, in Israel, and then he went and made an overnight stop uh, in Turkey, uh, where I believe, where my understanding is, er well, I mean, I think we know Erdogan did not meet with him, which further dealt Erdogan out of the game. Now, um, I think you're asking me, though, more broadly, uh, also, how has the more assertive uh, Turkey uh, that a friend talked about. How has that been received in Washington? Um, look, I, I think it's, um, it's been a very problematic adjustment. Uh, as solely laid out, I mean, for a long time, for many years, um, we were accustomed to um, Turkey being a very loyal ally. Um, you know, I remember all of, when I worked in the State Department in the 1980s, you know, all the encomia, the praise we would shower uh, on Turkey for being the most loyal, for not the most, but for being as loyal as loyal could be, let's say, was certainly the tone. Um, I mean, it was certainly not done in a comparative sense with other allies, but Turkey was privately seen as really a uh, uh, very loyal ally. Um, look, I, I think if I could just talk a little bit about the evolution of the relationship from the US point of view, um, there have always been bumps in the roads. Uh, um, not during, even during the Cold War, the 1964 Johnson letter, uh, when uh, the US threatened that if Turkey had intervened um, in Cyprus, that we wouldn't guarantee that NATO would protect it just in case the Soviets chose that time to invade. Um, uh, kind of speculation on speculation, and Turkey did not intervene in that circumstance, but was deeply offended when that letter became public. Um, the arms embargo from 1975 to 78, um, uh, after Turkey did intervene in Cyprus. Um, and um, 
Uh, I, I mean, those were probably the two major ones during the Cold War, but there were certainly other bumps along the road. Uh, but for the most part, for the period of the Cold War, from the time Turkey joined NATO in 1952 until the end of the Cold War, there was a common vision and that sustained us, even when Turkey moved into Cyprus, um, there was a common vision that there was a real Soviet threat, that the communists were a threat, and um, it had to be resisted and, if possible, defeated. That changed at the end of the Cold War. Um, and it's very interesting, the anecdote about Eagle Burger. Uh, I can remember in the halls of the State Department, and I was actually at that point working on Middle East issues, not on Turkey, but you know, I had friends on the Turkish desk and who I remained interested. And I remember the Turkish desk officer saying to me, um, actually just after the Gulf War, uh, he said, you know, Alan, it's all over now. You know, um, Cold War is over, Gulf War is over, we won the Gulf War. Turkey's, we're gonna go our own way. Um, and I think there were others who had a different strategic perception about Turkey's potential importance. And I give here uh, major credit to um, the late diplomat uh, Richard, Holbrook. Richard Holbrook. And um, as well as Mark Grossman, who became uh, uh, ambassador in 1995. In 1994, I think Holbrook set out what became the new organizing principle of U.S.-Turkish relations when he said, Turkey, <clears throat> excuse me, Turkey is at the center of every issue of importance to the United States on the Eurasian continent. Um, that became it. It was all about Turkey's location. Um, uh, or as Prime Minister Yilmaz once said, location, location, location. Um, and the pro and, you know, indeed that was far-sighted. I mean, after all, where were our subsequent problems? I mean, to this day, immediate, in the immediate Middle East area, Iraq, Iran, in the Balkans, um, uh, you know, you go around the clock. Russia, of course, became, once again, emerged as a problem. The problem, though, with the whole Brookian um, formulation, um, I don't fault him for this. I mean, I think it was intrinsic uh, to the times. He wanted to save the relationship. But it was very situational. Um, it sort of presumed that the US and Turkey would continue to see these regional issues in the same way, just as we had more or less been on the same page during the Gulf War, although Turkish opinion really was not. But Turgut Özal, the president of Turkey, was on the same page. And there was a feeling that the Turkish leadership would be with us. Well, over time, that changed, as has been laid out uh, here. And um, I, I'm going to go over a lot of territory, uh, <laughs> skip over a lot of territory. But you know, as the Erdogan government came along. Um, well, first of all, there was the Iraq War of 03, uh, which, despite the fact that I personally believe from having, uh, I would at that point been able to be, because of my position working in the House of Representatives, was able to meet, be in delegations and met with him. Uh, I think he won it. Um, the parliament to approve uh, the use of Turkish territory by U.S. forces to go into uh, Iraq. Not that he was a great believer in it for foreign policy reasons, but for certain internal reasons, I believe he meant it. Um, but it was a secret vote, and although it didn't get a majority, Although it did, it got more yeses than noes. It didn't get an absolute majority, and um, 
it didn't pay off. And that was kind of a slap. I, I think that was the first time that people started thinking, oh, well, this really isn't the Cold War Turkey anymore. And um, there have been many diff other differences over the years. Uh, and as we move more towards the era where er Erdogan is proclaiming strategic autonomy, which is really begins, uh, as Efren and Soli said, um, a pace in the second uh, decade of this century. Um, I think it's been a hard adjustment, but I think basically there has been an adjustment of expectations. And I'm going to read, because I want to make sure I get this quote exactly right. Um, uh, glad I brought this piece of paper. I thought you might ask me something like this. Um, I thought it was very interesting in June of this year. Uh, Jake Sullivan was asked uh, by Fareed Zakari, Jake Sullivan, the National Security uh, Advisor, was asked by Fareed Zakari on CNN, um, you know, what about this anti-American rhetoric that we heard in the, from President Erdogan in the recent election campaign, which had just concluded with Erdogan's victory? Um, and, you know, Sullivan tried to, more or less tried to dismiss that. He, he said, oh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's just politics. You know, they have these campaigns. You know, they're a democratic country. They have these campaigns. There's always a lot of anti-Americanism. Actually, he was being very diplomatic. This was, from my observation, far and away the most anti-American rhetoric I've heard in a Turkish campaign. But then he goes on to say, regarding Turkey, they're charting an independent foreign policy, but one in which we can have a constructive relationship with them. And that's a real, to me, that's a real downgrade um, of how the US saw Turkey for so long. It means, yes, they're in the alliance. Uh, we certainly want to be able to um, uh, cooperate when we can, but we know basically they are only going to do it when it's in their interests, not as, not out of any loyalty to the alliance. At least that's how I understood it, and I think that's more or less where the perception is now. I hope that I didn't go on too long. On not that. at all, Alan. Thank you very much, and it's interesting some of the words you used, including downgrade in that context. I find that very interesting because when you look at Capstone U.S. foreign policy documents, including the National Security uh, Security Strategy document, the U.S. seems to be recognizing the the global geopolitical shift. It doesn't say so in so many words, but from a unipolar moment to a an evolution I'm sorry towards for my from a unipolar moment yeah. to a a potentially uh, multipolar moment, and it speaks about the need for the United States to work increasingly with allies. And that came after, I think, a, a dismissal of very strong rhetoric that the world was being divided between those that stand up for the global uh, rule or the global, what was it called, the rules-based order, as opposed to those who don't. Because I believe the United States recognized that that was leaving a vacuum that countries like China and, and Russia were being able to benefit from. So there's a bit of a inconsistency in that regard if the U.S. is actually moving towards a, a posture where it works with countries and allows them, if you will, more freedom in their, in their engagement, then Turkey should fit that description. So it's interesting, it, it, the loyalty that the United States expects from Turkey, I think the problem there is that no longer fits Turkey or the mindset that prevails Right, and notice Turkey. he does say we can still have a constructive yes, relationship yes. with them. That's why it's I wonder whether- It's very important. It's not to say we're writing exactly. Turkey off. Yes. Uh, to me, that's more of a possibly a new paradigm where the solution may be yes. to the relationship, if both sides can manage that. I think the, that the U.S. has moved towards a new paradigm in yes. that regard. Shafak, I want to come to you and thank you for your patience. Um, I want to pick up a little bit on this. Another interesting concept that, that Alan mentioned, which I think is critical, is organizing principle. He referenced that in the, as, a, as something that's missing in the Turkish-US relationship, which I agree, but I think it's also missing in the conduct of Turkish foreign policy. And, and the example, for example, that Soli gave, the oscillations that we see rhetorically and in terms of 
of policy is a problem. And I want to come to you as a, a long-standing diplomat and ask you to walk us into the minds of the mind of uh, a Turkish diplomat, a career diplomat, who sees this happening. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, we were raised in the foreign ministry, not through education, but I think inherently, to believe that consistency matters. We wouldn't describe it as loyalty, but I think we would describe it as coherence in our policy. Reliability. Reliability. Uh, and hence, we would believe that that is actually a source of strength. Predictability is not necessarily a, a weakness, but rather a source of strength. Whereas today, and that really is depicted as a weakness by the current political elite, I believe, in Turkey, and increasingly, I would argue, by maybe Turkish society at large that has bought into this argument that Turkey is now following a more independent foreign policy. How do you see these dynamics evolving, and what sorts of implications do you see for the future of Turkish foreign policy? Well, thank you very much, Alper. Uh, I know that that is both an advantage and a weight on me to speak last, and not only for this panel, but for the whole day. <laughs> So uh, I must have taken stock of all that has been said, shared in this uh, room today. And uh, that is why I will try not to be repetitive, but try to uh, give you from my own perspective of 40 odd years in the service uh, of my country, how the things evolved. And speaking of organizing principles, we did have them, not only us, everybody knew them, and why uh, all this happened that we cannot anchor Turkey's foreign policy in, in one or another uh, specific way. First of all, let's go back to the genesis of what Turkish foreign policy is, was, or should be about. The Republican foreign policy is the antithesis of the empire. There was a clear break between the uh, foreign dealings of our predecessor. Politically, it was the will of the people that overwhelmed the self-assumed, assumed, sanctified power. This was the first clear break with the past. Secondly, historically, it replaced an outdated, discredited dynasty. Geographically, we acted on the national pact, that is, defined, determined boundaries for realistic and realizable Turkish homeland. Nationally, it was conceived through a countrywide, a countrywide mobilization for independence, for liberation. The National Assembly, this is a particularly important point in our national and state identity. The National Assembly became the soul of the nation. And it predates by a, a solid three and a half years the republic itself, which it in fact, proclaimed. So the National Assembly, that is the national will, is the mother of all uh, concepts that make up the republic. Individually, citizen replaced the subject. These may not be important points in Washington, because the United States also represents a much longer traje trajectory towards a democratic uh, governance, which took centuries in Europe as well as in the United States. Mentally, reason replaced dogma, and internationally, and this is the basis of the Turkish foreign policy, sovereign equality replaced imperial domination. So any talk of uh, neo-Ottomanism or anything of that kind of uh, stuff falls within the category of a lost dream or is purely ideological. The problem for us, 
but especially for people in the capitals like the United States, like Washington and uh, other major capitals, the problem is how to distinguish between what Turkey's own interests and natural trajectory is and will be, and how are you going to sort it out uh, under this ideological bombardment on a daily basis. So what is Turkish interest and what is the personal choice or the subjective uh, political uh, inclination of uh, the current government? I will not go into how the uh, Turkish foreign policy uh, proceeded throughout through the uh, Republican era, because it has already been uh, uh, elaborated on by uh, our uh, distinguished professor and uh, by Soli uh, Özel. But two questions were uh, <clears throat> influential, both Turkey's own uh, journey to modernity uh, domestically and it also impacted on its foreign relations. As an avid reader of history, I found out that it takes two generations, basically two generations, for the elite and the cadres which establish a new system after a trauma. And Turkey had it both ways. A state just vanished and it the new state was created through a war which followed a succession of other wars. So this was a big trauma for our people. It takes two generations because the first one establishes, uh, founds the new system, and the second one elaborates and consolidates it. And by the third generation, that should, be, that should have been, in Turkey's case, around the 80s, the country should become more self-confident and hence more democratic. Yes, the Turkish democracy improved incrementally, but not in the way that we or many wished it to be. These two questions related to the very existence of the Turkish Republic itself. The, uh, one was territorial integrity and national unity. Because it was built on a rump empire. It received populations uh, from elsewhere, basically from Balkans. Half of my family, my mother's uh, ancestry is from today's Greece and in Macedonia. And this was a sticking point for the Turkish governments, successive governments. This was, and it fell on its lap in the form of the Kurdish question. The second one was how to modernize Turkey and in the terms of uh, the founders, uh, the founding uh, generation of our republic, how we would reach the point of the uh, contemporary civilization. Mind you, uh, this is used in singular, not plural. This is not because our people did not know that there are more than one civilization in the world. But this depicted a bar then, as uh, Mr. Uh, Özel has already told, it, it was Europe then where a new uh, governance system based on the people's <coughs> power was established and there was an elaborate uh, system of law which uh, dominated, uh, ruled uh, the <coughs> daily lives as well as the statehood of all these countries. And Turkey borrowed from that. That was the only place to borrow. But, and this was important because it was about modernizing Turkey within an accountable uh, regime. 
And the main uh, nemesis for this process was seen as the old state structure, which was sanctified by religion. So they had an added sensitivity towards any <coughs> religious injection into the uh, republic's legal, political, uh, and social system. And then the second uh, fear fell again on the lap of the republic in the form of Islamism. So there were two failures which uh, the republic had feared all along, and it came big. The post-war, the post-Second World War, was important in many different respects. You can talk about Stalin's demands concerning our northeastern provinces as well as the Marmara Straits, but I think which made a more enduring impact regarding the uh, post-war outlook of uh, Europe was that uh, Europe, with the exception of the area under the control of the Soviets and the Iberian Peninsula, became a family of democracies for the first time. Turkey viewed the European model because of its democracy, but now it became uh, more wholesome. So the contemporary civilization in the aftermath of the Second World War was uh, more or less uh, used synonymous with Western Europe. Of course, this Western, the word, uh, the repetition of Western also uh, created a different uh, domestic problem in Turkey because the traditional ways of uh, pursuit of life and social behavior, not everyone was receptive uh, for this being a Western or Westernized. So, it became a schism along the, uh, across the Turkish society. As on the one hand, you have the uh, modernizing urban, uh, basically middle class, and on the other hand, the traditional uh, rural, uh, provincial Anatolia. Can and I ask you to wrap it up in maybe one or two minutes? Sure, sure. So this is where we were uh, when we came to the 90s the post-Cold War era, Turkey moved from a uh, flank member of NATO to interregional centrality. Its growing economic, political, and soft power uh, made it a more visible player in its broader region. It set in motion the push and pull dynamics for Turkey. You could again see it in its entire neighborhood. And there was a global diffusion of power, the uh, uh, unipolar moment uh, was not that uh, obvious for, a, for a many different countries, and it was not as long as the United States ever believed it to be. And the fourth factor, the growing regional cooperation and regional ownership was uh, becoming a more uh, visible feature of the Turkish foreign policy. This was the point where the AKP came to power, and probably perhaps in my second intervention, I will uh, dwell on that a little bit. Th thank, thank you, you. very much, Shafak. You, I think you weaved us through the intertwined dynamics and elements that feed into foreign policy thinking in Turkey from the early days of the Republic, in fact, prior to the establishment of the Republic in the form of uh, parliamentary role uh, up until today. I am going to forfeit my second round and go to questions, but before I do, and I will start with the lady in the back, but before I do so, I want to throw out two questions that I, I wish I, I will leave with our panelists. They may wish to answer them or not, because I think they're relevant. We haven't uh, talked about those. One is about the changing circumstances in which Turkish foreign policy is conducted, conceived, and implemented as far as institutional developments are concerned. 
And there are two dimensions to that, obviously, the transition to the presidential, the executive presidential system, whereby line ministries have really been sidelined. There are arguments that now with Hakan Fidan taking the helm of the foreign ministry, the role of the foreign ministry is increasing again, but be that as it may, I think it's rather limited. So what kind of an impact is that having on the conduct of Turkish foreign policy? And the second element to that is the personalized nature of foreign policy. Nowadays, you know, the, the big elephant in the room Will Turkey greenlight Sweden? I don't think anybody else but one person in Turkey knows the answer to that. So uh, that is a new element in Turkish foreign policy. If you can ponder that, uh, I'd be very appreciative. The young lady in the back. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Vedia Eidelman. Um, in foreign policy, we often talk about carrots and sticks. Um, I specialize in sticks. Uh, I'm a <laughs> sanctions lawyer. <laughs> um, and we can, we can argue about whether sanctions are efficient another day, but um, Mr. Ozan mentioned that Turkey is not the same Turkey and West is not the same West. And this morning, uh, Professor White was uh, answering a question that came from the audience about why Turkey is not taking a stronger st stance against the humanitarian crisis going on in China against the Uyghur um, minorities. And Professor, West was, uh, Professor White was saying that um, it's... Uh, basically just showing cowardice because they don't want to irritate the Chinese. Uh, my question is, this may be strongly worded, but it seems that, Tur that the U.S. is similarly showing cowardice in Turkey-related issues. Um, for example, for the recognition of the uh, Armenian genocide, you know, a lot of people expected the U.S. to recognize it as a genocide on the 100th anniversary. That didn't happen. One could reasonably argue that uh, the relationship with Turkey was a factor of that decision not to recognize it. Um, the purchase of a Russian missile system as a NATO member, they uh, sanctioned maybe like three individuals um, and nothing more. Um, human rights violations against women, LGBTQ, religious and ethnic minorities, and intellectuals and oppo uh, opposition politicians, like. Osman Kavala Selat and Demirtas, these individuals are still in jail. Um, the Gezi protests, like we, we, the, the US did not really show any sticks to Turkey in, in, in reaction to any of these um, occurrences. And I'm just really curious as to what your, in, what, what your take is or, or insight is as to why. Is it because it can't afford to lose Turkey as an ally? Is it uh, going back to location, 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 um, because you know the U.S. doesn't seem to have a problem using, losing um, its relationship with other countries like Venezuela or Syria. So um, I'm I'm very curious to hear um, your insights, especially, um, uh, sorry, Mikowski, um, Mr. Mikowski, if you could um, enlighten me, I would be very <laughs> you grateful. Can call Thank me you so much. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to be formal. Thank you for your question. Are there any carrot holders? <laughs> yes, please. It doesn't have to be a carrot. Any question you have, please. Hi, um, Larry Rubin, uh, <laughs> at professor at um, Salmon School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. And my question, I have two questions. You can feel free to combine them. Um, one is more specific, Professor Ozil. Um, you mentioned the Arab uprisings were kind of like an ideological opportunity for Turkey. And I was curious if there, were, if you and others might think about um, or comment on were there challenges in that way? Does Turkey see it as, did Turkey see it as, uh, at the uprisings as actually challenges or threats to, to its um, position? Um, so maybe have others push back if anybody believes that. And the second one is, is really thinking about the decade um, after the uprisings. Would you consider, would you think that foreign policy changes were more a product of external or internal pressures? And I, I want to push you on one or the other because you'll probably say a combination of both. But anyway, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Hey, Jam, can we start with you? Because I think I may have constrained your time more than I did to the gentleman. I'd like to that make up for okay. that. Um, Discrimination. Put it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so pretty much the questions are uh, similar in a way. Uh, the question that he raised and the question that he raised um, about uh, uh, the changes or the systemic changes, domestic changes, external changes that Turkish foreign policy um, has been responding to, which, which 
kind of factors that the Turkish pol foreign policy has been responding to. I think these two questions are very, very similar, and maybe I can uh, somehow um, expand on that question. Um, but also your question about the, the Turkish foreign policy with regard to Uyghur problem and American foreign policy and the similarity between uh, American foreign policy towards Turkey. I think um, that if you look at what is going on in the world in terms of foreign policy making, what we have been witnessing is a rising transactionalism and interest-based foreign policy, not just in Turkey, but in the US, as you've been mentioning, but also in the European Union, which used to be this principled uh, actor in foreign policy making more underlining normative principles, human rights principles, and this and that. In fact, every actor globally is changing and adapting um, to the um, to this systemic changing in the, in the global world order. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a huge debate, of course, what's changing uh, globally. Uh, but what we do see is that we do see some of these things are have already been mentioned. Um, systemically, um, the global distribution of wealth is changing, uh, which creates a new sort of um, conflicts and also uh, competition between the global powers. Uh, we have seen um, domestic changes, uh, both in the rise of populism everywhere, uh, and the populist governments don't, specifically populist governments in the West, uh, don't want to bear the costs of the liberal international order. They are not democratic themselves, so they don't really want to uh, support global democracy. And we do see uh, sort of back and forth. We have uh, witnessed that in the case of US as well, uh, from Trump to Biden presidency. Uh, but that is a trend as well. And these governments domestically underline focused transactionalism, interest-based foreign policy making. And if I use the middle power category for Turkey again, middle powers usually respond uh, to the changes, systemic changes, um, in, in this, you know, like more major, in, in, in major, uh, let me say it differently, um, countries which are major powers. Um, so that's another thing, I guess. What we have also seen is that not just in Turkey, Turkey, of course, um, have the level of democracy in Turkey have declined radically when we compare to the other OECD or European countries. But the level of democracy globally have declined as well. That is a systemic change too. And when you don't have the liberal democracy, you may not criticize, and this goes to the populist government argument uh, that I may, but you won't criticize the other government's um, uh, anti-democratic um, policies or uh, practices, I can say. Um, what else I can say? Um, You're free to stop. Yeah, okay, I'm <laughs> just going to stop. So there's a, a lot of this changing, not just in Turkey, but uh, at a more systemic level too. And that goes to the, your question about the personalization um, of Turkish politics, which is um, democratic decline, uh, parallel to democratic decline in Turkey as well. So Thank you. Something. I'd like to invite our other speakers if they'd like to, with only two minutes each, please, if, if you'd like to take I'll up any of these questions. Just a question. Okay. Um, well, let me answer the question, at least, that was directed to me. Um, so I think I'd be remiss if I didn't correct my understanding of some of your facts, first of all. So um, the... Uh, Armenian genocide has now been recognized. I'm not sure it happened by 2015. I believe it did in Congress. Um, but uh, President Biden has clearly recognized it. As a matter of fact, his first um, April 24th, Armenian Genocide Day, uh, the day before his first communication with President Erdogan was to call him to let him know that um, he was going to uh, make a statement acknowledging the Armenian genocide the following day. Um, regarding the, I believe you suggested that the uh, um, 
anti-missile defense units that were bought from Russia uh, were not punished other than just sanctions on a couple of people. Actually, there's been a more serious sanction than that, and it's actually on the arms procurement agency mm -hmm. in Turkey, the SSB, as it's known. Um, you can argue, we've also, regarding the F-16s, which hasn't been happened yet, we don't know if it will, they've looked for ways around our own, uh, they, I mean the executive branch has looked for ways around the sanctions that Congress has put on, nevertheless it's there. But let me just, I, I think what you're really asking is, why isn't, you, and then you mentioned human, several human rights issues, um, including, I'm not sure how many the LGBT, certainly the Kurdish issue of Zman Kavala, um, uh, I think so many human rights issues. Look, I, first of all, I think I've worked in both the State Department and I've worked at the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, as a staffer at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, not as a congressman. Um, and almost every executive branch in the world emphasizes national interests, what's best for national security. Um, that's what the taxpayers pay them to do as they understand it. Every regime in the world, whether it's democratic or non-democratic, has a foreign ministry and an executive branch, and they tend to look, first of all, at realpolitik. That is not to say that they totally ignore human rights. And I think it's always a struggle, particularly for Americans. Um, and you know, I felt it when I was in the State Department. Uh, um, who, for Americans who see themselves, uh, for, what do you say, Americans, comma, as I think Americans in general see themselves as the leader in the world on human rights issues, um, it's always a difficult act. And sometimes they end up on the wrong side. Uh, but um, even President Biden, he said human rights was going to be at the center of his foreign policy. By the way, I consider myself a Biden Democrat, just for the record. Um, uh, I was formed from early in the primaries. Uh, um, but he has not been able to do that entirely. And I think the best one can hope is that human rights remains, by the way, sometimes it's on the agenda and people don't know about it. Because sometimes some administrations believe the best way to deal with it with certain countries is to deal with it privately. Uh, that usually is not the best way in my view, but um, but I think the best we can hope is that in some fashion, it remains very high on the agenda, not too far behind uh, more narrowly defined national interests. And it, it's a real tension in U.S. foreign policy. There have been many books written on it. Thank it's you, Shafak Bey, and then I'll turn to Saudi if he has anything to add. Go ahead, Shafak Bey. Would you like to go ahead first? Sorry. Sorry. I, w I was asked the question whether or not people saw in the Arab uprising a threat. To the best of my knowledge, no, nobody did. I mean, that, so to the extent that this was seen as Arab publics finally, and in my judgment, as part of a wave between 2006 and 2014, everywhere in the world, including the United States, with the Occupy Wall Street and all that, uh, everybody, and, and since our problem also was about democracy. Uh, the secular part for its own reasons and the government for its own reasons actually supported it. The calculation for the government was they go to democracy, they will have elections, the only organized force is the Muslim Brotherhood, these are people we have organic links with, and therefore there will be a series of Muslim Brotherhood run uh, governments and we of course are the jewel on the necklace and all that and uh, that it would that, that Turkey would take Turkey would take the lead 
And that's why, that's what exacerbated the ideological component of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, that, of that foreign policy. And, uh, you, uh, and whether, whether the political changes were fr from the outside, no, the, the political changes all came from the top. And it's very, it's like, look, just this recent example. A year ago, you're canceled. Yesterday, you're my best buddy. Will the public say anything? No. We will just observe it. The thing is, I'm very happy that this changed. But uh, no, it all comes, um, it basically is uh, the will of uh, one person. As Alper Bey said at the beginning, we don't know when Sweden's accession will be cleared, and only one person in the country knows both what will happen and when it will happen. Please, uh, To complement uh, the previous speakers, let me try to put in context uh, very briefly uh, what the impact of the, uh, the Arab uprisings have been uh, on both the Turkish government and in Turkey, Turkey's domestic uh, policies. Uh, first of all, uh, starting from uh, 2009 in earnest, the government uh, began to move beyond uh, the structured frame of the Turkish foreign policy. Uh, the ideological intentions became more pronounced and self-confidence over the uh, increasing, uh, increasingly uh, stronger control of other state institutions uh, bolstered their self-confidence all the while uh, when the uh, negotiations with the EU faltered. The understanding, historic uh, understanding of history by the Turkish Islamists, that is the government and the leadership today, is an anti-historical one. It's a sense of st statehood in constant, in constant time imbued in patriarchal, patriarchal religiosity. In their uh, view, Turkey is the modern time continuity of a constant past, present, and future, not a modern nation which has overtaken its past. The uh, 2013, when the uh, Muslim Brotherhood drive in a uh, range of Arab countries came to note. For Turkey, there was a confluence of events. The uh, weeks when uh, Mor Morsi was uh, told that his time was up uh, by the uh, Egyptian military and supported by the original owners of the Tahrir revolution, we had the Gezi Park demonstrations. The government had already internalized the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, claim for power in their respective countries. And when that backfired, they took it upon themselves as well. And with the Gezi Park demonstrations, they said there must be a conspiracy. From within and from without, we are being targeted. And they saw an existential threat directly directed uh, towards themselves. And they never recovered from that uh, syndrome, syndrome since. So uh, maybe this will be an answer uh, to the gentleman's question about uh, its domestic implications. Thank you. May I just add Please. something, just Please. a couple of words in terms of uh, uh, Arab uprisings and how it changed Turkish foreign policy. And I do think that it basically uh, evoked two sorts of transnationalism. Uh, the first one was Kurdish transnationalism, uh, which Turkey sees as an ontological threat, and, uh, and then transformed Turkish foreign policy, uh, or the, the, the way that Turkey dealt with the Kurdish policy or the Kurdish question became more geopolitical afterwards and became more integral to its foreign policy, that is first. And the second, uh, what you have seen is uh, Sunni transnationalism, which Turkey saw as an opportunity and aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, that it was already there, but that relationship became more important 
Uh, so I think those two sorts of transnational identities, which was really linked to the 2011 uprisings, have transformed Turkish foreign policy making. Emre Hocam, thank you. And thank all of you as well for participating and for your questions. If I could kindly ask you to join me in a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alpar and the panelists. It was a great discussion. Uh, we'll end it there. Um, once again, uh, thank you for coming. And let me also thank our, my colleagues uh, at the Middle East Institute. They're all back in there, but they were the ones who put together this event. I'm very grateful and hope to see you next year. Thank you too, Gary.